Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirk, Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Serendipity, Tactility, and Community, Library Research as a Practice of Wonder, which is sponsored by Wilfrid Laurier University Press. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I would just like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you may see a Q&A panel and perhaps a chat panel. If you don't, um, there's a series of buttons that come up along the bottom of your screen if you move your mouse over the presentation. Um, the one that looks like a dialogue cloud should open up the chat box for you. And if you click the three dots um, on the right-hand side there, that should open up a menu which will allow you to find the Q&A panel. So please do use the uh, Q&A panel throughout to submit questions to our speaker today. At the end of the presentation, she'll take a few minutes to answer your questions. So as I said, do send in your questions throughout. Um, if you're experiencing any technical issues, that's what the chat box is for. You can message me directly and I will troubleshoot the issue with you privately there. Today, um, we are using the hashtag ACRL Choice Webinars. Uh, to communicate about the program. Uh, so if you know, have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. I would also mention that we uh, are using the hashtag today too, Oceans Remember, um, to talk with Sonia um, about her book. So without further ado, I'll take a moment to introduce our speaker today. She is Sonia Boone, um, and she is the Associate Professor of Gender Studies at Memorial University. An award-winning researcher, writer, and teacher, she is the author of What the Oceans Remember, Searching for Belonging and Home, uh, published by Wilfrid Laurier in 2019, and three scholarly monographs, the most recent titled Autoethnography and Feminist Theory at the Water's Edge, Unsettled Islands, published in 2018. For six years, she was the principal flutist with the Portland Baroque Orchestra in Oregon, and I believe with that, we are ready to get started. So I will turn the floor over to you, Sonia. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thanks. Uh, my thanks for this invitation to share my thoughts. And also my thanks to all of you who are listening and uh, I guess watching the slides go by today. I know things are very busy. Also thanks to Wilfrid Laurie University Press and to Claire uh, Hitchens for facilitating this. So I wanted to start with a bit of background. Um, so over the last few years, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how we, and I'm thinking here collective we, we as in, academia and academic researchers at large approach scholarly research and writing. And this has come from my own experiences as someone who can write and research in sort of really conventional ways, but also someone who's feeling increasingly hemmed in uh, by those conventional ways. And further, as someone who's feeling pushed too far by ideologies of efficiency. But I'm also coming at it from the perspective of someone who's teaching students. Um, and trying to get students really excited about research and about libraries and all that kind of thing. And so the words that have kept returning to me over the last few years have been words like space, wonder, magic, dreams, longings, desires. And these are words that uh, don't really have a lot of space in our current efficiency-driven models of academic work. Um, and this presentation is shaped by those ideas, but also definitely by my most recent research project, uh, which will appear next month. So what the oceans remember demanded a lot from me uh, in ways that I didn't necessarily expect. So it demanded a lot from me intellectually, which I was totally expecting, but it also demanded a lot from me emotionally and physically. And I, I mean, I didn't need to scale mountains or anything, but I had to confront myself and my research in sometimes unexpected ways. I, it demanded my vulnerability, my openness. It wanted me to wander and to wonder, and to pause, reflect, uh, the book is based on archival research, and I've worked with archival materials for decades, um, first as a musician working with music archives, then with text-based archives. And so over that time, as one does, one develops certain systems in terms of how to organize material, how to work with material, et cetera. Um, but those systems were completely inadequate to the needs of this particular project. 
Um, this particular project was about trying to make sense of the afterlives of complicated family histories of migration, slavery, indenture. And it was about breaking apart some of the conventional ways of categorizing things. And because it involves my own family histories, I couldn't tell it in a traditional scholarly sort of way. And so all the systems I developed were completely inadequate. So that particular research process, probably because it's the most recent, but also has been the most transformative, haunts this presentation. And in this way, it's, I think it's also going to haunt any other research I do after this point. Um, because it was so present um, in the preparation of this presentation, I also wanted it to be physically haunting the presentation itself as a way of making the notions of serendipity, tactility, and community visible, uh, which are sometimes hard to make visible because the presentation is still a virtual presentation offered by distance. So what I have in the background of every slide, and I've pulled that up here, um, is one page from my archival research. There's nothing particularly serendipitous about this. I knew this was a page that I would find. I knew it existed. But as I look at this page, what I can see is I can feel the paper, even though I'm, I'm not touching it right now. I can feel its smooth pulpiness against my skin. I can still feel the, com the corners crumble as I touch it. I know still how it felt in my hands, how, what it, how it weighed, all that kind of stuff. I know how it was put together. I know how it fit in relation to all the other documents of that particular file, how that file fit into the larger context and so on. Um, so this, what this is, is a page from the accounting declaration for Sarah Plantation in the South American country of Suriname. And this is a plantation on which at least 16 of my ancestors were enslaved. This declaration was made in 1862, the year before slavery was abolished. And it came about because enslavers uh, wanted compensation for lost property, quote unquote, lost property. And for every person they enslaved, they would receive 300 guilders. But to get it, they had to register and count all the enslaved. Um, and this particular accounting declaration includes the names of 14 of my ancestors. And here, around that square box, you see Frederick, the name Frederick, uh, a man born in 1798. And that's the furthest back that my family tree can, has been recorded in that particular side of the family. Uh, Frederick, his sons and daughters, and his grandchildren are all listed on this record, and his great-grandchildren were the first to born, be born free. His great-grandchildren was my great-great, my great-grandmother is where it goes. Now, when I first saw this page on the records, I wanted to distance myself from it. I wanted to just organize, document, catalog, remain objective. But I was unable to do this because the research demanded my whole body, and it really demanded um, what I see as a practice of wonder. And so I wanted it to remain here in the presentation, in the background, as a reminder of the need for whole body knowledge and of the promise of whole body knowledge and how we might think about producing whole body knowledge. Um, it also reminds me that while wonder is about awe and inspiration and astonishment and marvels, it's also about horror and grief and vulnerability and that research practices, both in libraries and archives, need to make space for all of that. So what this presentation for me is, is looking at some of the intersections between library research and archival research, which of course are sometimes the same because archival collections are sometimes in libraries. Um, it's also a thinking through of libraries, perhaps a return to the idea of libraries as spaces of wonder and imagination. And maybe it's not a return because likely if you work in a library, you already feel that way. Um, but really not just about libraries as places for efficient consumption of knowledge, which is essentially what my students want them to be. Um, and it's really a series of questions more than it is a series of answers, um, which hopefully will lead to further reflection both on my part and perhaps also for you on possible ways forward. So it's in a sense an opening to a conversation rather than a completed conversation. Uh, so here's where I come at it from. As a lover of libraries, probably not surprising, I have had a library card for as long as I can remember. Uh, and I have spent, I don't even know how many hours I've spent in libraries from the time I was small. I probably read almost every book in the junior section of our local town library. And for me, that was really, the library was a space of the imagination. I could travel through time, inhabit different worlds, inhabit different bodies. It was fantastic. The library was also my first job, right? Working as a shelver at a library is my first job as a teenager, um, putting books back on shelves. And also with a friend of mine, we all both worked there. We would 
read her we would wait when we were putting things together we would wait to see where the harlequin romances would open up and read them out loud to each other silly things you do when you're a teenager uh, i also worked as a library staff member in vancouver public libraries later on as an adult um, and as an adult in vancouver uh, i worked both on the desk and shelving books and i learned a lot about libraries as spaces of community uh, from elderly people who came in just to chat young people studying for exams, immigrants preparing for citizenship tests. We had a family that would bring in Rubbermaid bins full of books and stop in for story time, newcomers planning summer vacations. It really was this space, a library, the community hub, as I mentioned here. Then I moved into becoming a researcher in libraries, just as many happy hours as I spent reading. Um, so fondling books, smelling them, reading them, carrying them around towns and cities in North America, Europe, South America. And so I've never lost my sense of wonder. And now I'm as a faculty member who's teaching students. And I'm, in how to fo I'm interested in how to foster wonder in my students, how to encourage wide sampling and grazing, how to bring the library alive beyond the immediate instrumental concerns of the next paper, the next thesis chapter. And I'm someone who's also, as a faculty member, frustrated by the way that discourses of efficiency have sort of moved even into library training and research. Uh, and this is not any single library here. This is just in general, the, the focus on this is how you get a really great search to go exactly where you want to go is really useful, but it can also be uh, limiting in some ways. And I really want to really encourage, for my students, libraries as spaces to encourage the generations that come after me to think about wonder, imagination, knowledge, and so on. So I wanted to think also about the notion of slow scholarship, which is something that has come into the academy in the last five or so years, although I suspect people have been talking about it for much longer. And in a 2013 article, Maggie Berg and Barb Sieber, who are the authors of The Slow Professor, they wrote an article before this point, they made the case for bringing the, bringing the slow movement to the university, and they point to the increasing corporatization of universities, as well as increased stress levels on faculty members who are asked to do more and more administrative work. And they particularly point out, and this is in the face of increasing casualization, so we had more and more precarious workers as well. And they point out that if there's one sector that should be slowing down in order to cultivate deep thought, it should be academic teachers. They say that's a quote from their work. And they point out that academic learners, too, are impacted by this. Um, they observe here, as you can see, time for reflection is not a luxury, but crucial to effective teaching and learning. And this is why they advocate a slow approach. And they draw from uh, the other slow movements, slow food, et cetera. So they have a quote here in response to the colleagues who've told us to wake up, get with a program, or that they're simply too busy to slow down. We wish to emphasize that the slow movement is not nostalgia for the good old days that never existed in the first place. It is, as Parkins and Craig put it, a process whereby everyday life in all its pace and complexity, frisson and routine, is approached with care and attention, an attempt to live in the present in a meaningful, sustainable, thoughtful, and pleasurable way. Now, if we look at the things that I've pointed out here, care, attention, meaning, sustainability, thoughtful, pleasure. Um, it strikes me that these principles should be central to student learning. And, that, and I think that cultivating a practice of wonder in our students might be a good way forward for that um, in terms of thinking through that. I also want to think about uh, Neil Gaiman's work about uh, words on libraries because he also doesn't at all talk about efficiency. He talks about freedom. He talks about, as you can see here, imagination, daydreaming, and then he talks about the fact that libraries can help individuals change their world. They can make the future and imagining that things can be different. So he doesn't talk at all about targeted searches. It's about safe spaces, learning spaces, dreaming spaces, world-changing spaces, um, and libraries really being about making new worlds possible. Um, I don't think most of you would disagree with this. I can't imagine that you would go into working in libraries or researching in libraries if you didn't already have an idea about this uh, in terms of libraries. But I'm not at all sure that my students understand libraries this way because most are really instrumental about their use of the library. They want a direct line to the exact thing that they need to read for the exact essay that they're working on at any given time. 
And I'm interested in trying to figure out, find ways and have a discussion, conversation about how we can possibly change with that, change things about that. So I wanted to share some definitions. Oxford English Dictionary Online, uh, which is a great place to hang out if you haven't done that before, although some of you might have. Uh, the word wonder, uh, something that causes astonishment, feeling or emotion aroused by something wondrous, a marvelous object, object of astonishment, profound admiration. But there's also this notion of the supernatural in there. So this is something that is beyond the everyday, something miraculous or supernatural, something marvelous, something surprising um, in that particular word as well. But there's also within the term wonder, ideas of evil, destruction, distress, and grief. And I find that very interesting, this notion, this oscillation between the two of those. So wonder, what I get out of that definition is the idea of wonder as something that's beyond the ordinary, beyond the everyday, something supernatural, things that happen beyond rational explanation. There's something magical in that. But because of that magic and because of that extraordinariness uh, and because of this association with the supernatural, there's also a wariness. There's a potential for evil, a potential for destruction, a potential for grief. So there's wonder that disrupts the seemingly, quote-unquote, natural order of things. And in this way, I think that wonder is actually perhaps also about vulnerability and openness, a willingness to reach beyond the everyday, a willingness to be open to the unexpected and the unpredictable, the surprising, and in this case, a sense of porosity, I guess, a porous sort of self. So for me, a practice of wonder is not just about going into the library and thinking about which books we want to read, but it's about attending consciously and actively to the work that we do, centering wonder in all of our approaches, from the searches we conduct to the books we decide to pull off the shelf, the way we choose to engage with them, the questions we ask about them, how we feel all of this in our bodies, and so on. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about practice. I'm going to leave the floor here to Danny Shapiro, a celebrated memoirist whose work some of you may have read who in her book, Still Writing, The Perils and Pleasures of a Creative Life, talks about developing a practice. And she writes, I sit down every day at around the same time, and I put myself in the path of inspiration. If I don't sit down, if I'm not there working, then inspiration will pass right by me. And then two pages later, the practice is the art. And that particular last quote, the practice is the art, actually brings to mind um, a quote from the work of Virginia Woolf from her autobiographical Moments of Being, which is interestingly also was the name of Danny Shapiro's blog for a while. And in, her, in Woolf's Moments of Being, Woolf writes, behind the cotton wool is hidden a pattern that we, I mean all human beings, are connected with this, that the whole world is a work of art, that we are parts of that work of art. Hamlet, or a Beethoven quartet, is the truth about this vast mass that we call the world. But there is no Shakespeare. There is no Beethoven. Certainly and emphatically, there is no God. We are the words. We are the music. We are the thing itself. So thinking about the practice is the art, and we are the thing itself, then practice is not just about habits that lead to the creation of art, but are in themselves art. And practice, then, is a deeply embodied commitment. It's never just about routine. It's not something just that we brush our teeth, we're done. It's something that we live in and through with every breath that we take. It's a principle for living and working. And so I see a practice of wonder as an openness to awe, to making oneself vulnerable to the sensuality of research and to the way that research can fundamentally move us, not, into, not just intellectually, but also emotionally and in deeply embodied ways. Um, so uh, the three things I wanted to think of in terms of sustaining a practice of wonder for me are serendipity, tactility, and community. I'm not going to read the definitions there because they're very short, and I'm sure you can catch up with them as well. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start with serendipity. So the faculty of making happy and unexpected discoveries by accident. So a long time ago, we were interviewing, here's our library, the QB2 library in 1982. You can see all those great cars. We were interviewing for a new librarian, a social sciences librarian, 
And my question to her was, how can I encourage student researchers to visit the library because I find this a uh, struggle? And her answer was serendipity. And she elaborated, stating that while a student might go to a library with a specific call number in mind, once they get to the stacks, they'll discover some other books that they didn't know about before. Um, and the books that might be even more relevant to their work than original choice. Uh, and I've done this myself. I can't count the number of times I've reached over the purple book, next shelf, I've been drawn to a title book over, another shelf over, I found things, and then I discover things that were actually better than I had before. Serendipity is a drug for those of us who work in the archives. We live for the moment when stuff appears as if by accident, by chance, suddenly there it is, that the puzzle opens itself up for us, there it is, it's just waiting for us, the scrap of information that we've been waiting for. Um, I want to look very briefly here in terms of, as an example of this, uh, the researcher Julia Gaffield, now working at Georgia State University, who during her PhD found the long rumor but never seen Haitian Declaration of Independence. Historians have been looking for it for over a century. Uh, and in 2010, she found it in a series of letters in the British archives. And the angels sang, and life was wonderful. Uh, serendipity in this way is the holy grail. It's what keeps us going back to the archives, what propels us forward. It keeps us going when the going gets tough, and sometimes archival work is just really drudgery. It's really, really boring sometimes. We wait for that ray of light to shine on us and to illuminate something. Now, in my own work, serendipity was discovering the ship's logs for... Um, ships that brought, almost all the ships that brought indentured laborers from what was then British India to the West Indies, um, and that they were actually in my own university in the Maritime History Archive. Now, supposedly there's nothing new about that. A lot of researchers have worked with the documents in the Maritime History Archive, but what was new was how this material linked up with my own project, and how suddenly my life in Newfoundland intersected directly with my family history in Suriname, something that I had never expected at all, and it made me think differently, new connections, new links, new possibilities. So serendipity I see as a sort of a pause, a moment of suspension where what comes before recedes, but what comes after isn't yet defined. We're sort of on the way there. I wonder where I'm sliding on here. Okay, and move on here. Um, I wonder also, so I see serendipity as being vital to library research as well. Um, and it's about opening up research and asking more questions. But I do wonder about current academic library systems which prioritize efficiency, speed, and focus. They're becoming increasingly precise. Plug in the right keywords and the library's collection opens up to you. And you've quickly got a list of materials that seem perfect for what you're doing. And for many of my students, that's it. That's where it ends. And I love it myself. I love the fact that I can go with a list of books to the library and I can find exactly what I want. And I also appreciate that these deeper electronic search functions have made it possible to recover often hidden voices of marginalized folks who will never have a fonts named after them, for example, um, who will never be the subject of an essay in the finding aids, but I can find them now. But I also find that current cataloging systems prioritize efficiency to such an extent as to inhibit serendipity. So, for example, to use a mapping metaphor, and I'll just go through this very quickly, the quickest route from my office to the only single independent bookstore in my town, 35 minutes walk, I can get there. But if I change the route, I might see different things along the way. And those different things might change how I read the book that I finally find at the bookstore. Um, so my question is, what happens if we embrace serendipity instead of following just the most efficient route? Um, we meander along the way, and we open ourselves to the possibilities that emerge from surprising encounters. And if we allow our minds to wander rather than following the most direct route. Now, that said, this mapping metaphor also shows us that serendipity is not entirely about chance. Um, we first have to have laid the groundwork in order for serendipity to appear for us. Would Julia Gaffield have found the Haitian Declaration of Independence just by poking around randomly? No. People have been trying that for a century. She needed to have a bit of a sense first and then to follow it for her intuition after that point. Um, I'm not going to do that next slide, so I'm going to slide to the right one there. So. My questions are, is how might we arrange library training and how might I arrange my teaching in ways that encourage students to embrace serendipity, in ways that ask them to engage with the library as a living, breathing space where chance encounters are just as important and sometimes more important than the planned journey that they came in with. 
How can we encourage student researchers to reach for the purple book or the one with the interesting title or to flip through the pages of the quote unquote wrong book to discover a sentence that jumps out of the page making it the right book? How can we encourage students researchers to spend time just wandering the stacks, not with any necessary goal in mind? Um, how can we move beyond the electronic cataloging systems to encourage students into the library itself and to imagine the library as archival researchers might, as spaces filled with treasures possibly hidden that you have to sniff out, as spaces governed not only by efficient cataloging systems but also by chance encounters, aisles you didn't expect to go down, kick stools that didn't let you reach quite far enough, books you didn't expect to find, conversations you didn't first expect to have. So that is my first point around a question about serendipity. I want to move into the idea of tactility or touch. I love this idea of touchiness, sensitiveness or touchiness. I like that idea. So to me, come on, I don't even need to go there yet. Here we go. So touch is not just about materiality of archival materials or library resources, but acknowledging touch as a site of knowledge, about the feeling of things, the touch as a source of insight. If those of us who work in archives fetishize serendipity, we totally fetishize tactility. How things feel can be as important as their contents. So when I was uh, researching in Middelburg, the Netherlands, I went to the archives of Zeeland to work with the materials of a, tra a Dutch seafaring trading company that got into slave trading in the 18th century. Um, my experiences there were shaped not only by the documents, but by my ability to touch them. Um, I could feel the paper, I could smell it, I could see how thick it was, I could see where ink soaked into the paper. Um, I got a sense of the different kinds of paper that were available in commercial invoices. I learned from the handwriting and the way the materials were bound. I could see how big the documents were. And sure, through the sheer volume of materials, I could get a sense of the bureaucratic structures of the slave trade. Uh, in the Maritime History Archive, it was similar, but there the, boxed, and the materials boxed and uh, folded, and some of it had been folded for 100 years, and it was sort of, the paper was crunchy, almost with salt air. It was very interesting. Um, so feeling, smelling, touching, and listening to documents made for a very different research experience. Now, since 2014, the Archives of Zeeland has begun digitizing its collection, and I totally appreciate why they're doing this. It protects the World Heritage Collection, but also making it at least somewhat accessible to researchers around the globe. But I argue that a lot, is, can, be lo a lot can be lost in the process. Um, so, because we lose that connection with touch. So, if we think about what touch can do, um, we've often seen sight as a basis for the scientific method, as a basis for common sense. So, you need to see it to believe it. Feminist theorists have engaged with touch as a radical alternative uh, to what a thinker named Lucy Rigore has called a specular economy. So, she suggested, and other theorists, how do we move away from sight? What could touch do differently? Um, and they suggest that sight distances. It determines the boundaries between self and other. It determines what is not us and also what is not like us. So one example you could have here is of human zoos popula populated by colonized peoples brought to Europe for the entertainment and display of Europeans, right? So this is a, a sight-based framework that articulates these people are not us and they are not like us. Touch is very different because it brings self and other together. It's not about distance. When you touch, you are also touched. You can't tell in the moment of touching who is touching and who is being touched. And these boundaries between self and other disappear. Touch is a sense that opens up other senses as well. Um, so touch is integral to archival research, and these are some examples of stuff that I did in Switzerland. I was working with medical consultation letters. Um, and so you can feel the paper itself, the texture. You can feel the ink and the wax seals, the folds, the salt. You can smell them. You can see whether it's solid or how it's crumbling. Um, now libraries, and certainly my own as well, are becoming increasingly focused on sight and focus less on touch with their more and more materials becoming e-resources. And in this way, I'd suggest that they're actually becoming uh, more and more disembodied. Uh, I don't know if anybody's read this novel, but it's quite a hilarious novel about a trend forecaster who uh, is experiencing 
uh, a world where people don't want to touch anything, but is hoping is starting to see some glimmer of a sense that people want to start to touch more. Uh, it describes this technology obsessed swiping society where people are not touching each other, only their technologies. And my question is, what happens to library experience when it becomes almost entirely virtual? when we remove touch from the research experience. And it's absolutely convenient and it's also necessary for students to access materials at any time of day or night to work on their projects because their schedules are complex, their needs are complex. And it's also been absolutely vital to making archival encounters possible by distance. I can access archival materials in a range of countries just via my computer. It's also vital, as I mentioned, to protecting valuable and irreplaceable manuscript materials. And my own experiences of crumbling paper certainly suggest that some materials are better left off as just online sorts of resources. Um, but what might we inadvertently lose in the process? And so here I've got a book on telepathy that I recently checked out of our university library in relation to a still small, very preliminary new project I'm working on. This is a book published in 1945. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's very different from what's published today. This book could be made available in digital form, um, and it could be in our library, say, as an ebook. Um, but what do we lose if we just turn it into an ebook? So one of the things when I was thinking, because it's, it's not a book that I would see very often, a book from 1945 in hard copy floating around. So online books can, ebooks can collapse time. Everything looks the same or almost the same no matter when it was published. So electronic versions offer us cleaned up, fresh white pages that look to be about the same size and everything becomes uniform and we lose the specificity of each book. And we lose sometimes essential context related to time. So the way a book was bound, the color of the pages, the thickness of the pages. Uh, we may also lose a sensual and sensuous engagement with books. Reading is a sensual process and it can and should engage all the senses. And online reading can limit our capacity to engage with them beyond sight. How does a book feel? What does it smell like? How much does it weigh? How do the pages turn? If you stuck your tongue out, how would it taste? Um, context. We might lose a sense of a connection to the actual physical dimensions of the book, the feel of it, its weight. Related to this, I might think of the fact that uh, when, I first saw, when I first saw Vermeer's Girl with a Red Hat, I had only seen big posters of it. So I thought it was a really big painting. And in reality, it's this tiny little painting. But I had no idea of that. I lost that context completely. Uh, community. We, yeah, I put up the date do things here. Library books used to have date do slips in the back, which is a comforting reminder that others were there before you and when they were there before you. And you can trace a community through those slips. And now the book just floats. You can also get a sense of how it was made, how it was bound, how it was designed. So electronic books, while absolutely beneficial and vital even, can end up inadvertently reducing knowledge and experience to the book's content and alone, to the words and images on the page, rather than everything else a book could tell you. Um, but anybody who's worked with archival materials knows that we never just focus on the content. We work on all sorts of aspects. Um, size, handwriting style, margins, paper type, wax seals. People even look at things like hair in the archives, which is what some of my friends might call icky archives. Um, so touch allows us to engage differently with material, but it also encourages us to experience knowledge more broadly and not to reduce it down to the narrow confines of text, but to a whole knowledge. Um, this is something that I had posted myself on Facebook because the paper was falling apart at one point. My question then is what might it mean to embrace touch as a vital source of knowledge and insight? What might that look like in a library context? How can we encourage students to develop touch as a primary research sense? Now my final point is about community. Um, and community isn't necessarily something one thinks of immediately in relation to archival work because usually we're working by ourselves. Or if we're quote unquote in community, we're irritating everyone around us because we're talking too loudly in the archives. But really archival work is about community. We build communities with those who live in the materials, with those who are fascinated by the various things that we're fascinated by. We get to know the archivists, et cetera. And library research is also about community. 
So I want to share two examples of that from our library collection. Here's two books from our library collection. Dark Side of the Nation, this is a photocopy because the actual book was out, and so I happen to have a photocopy of that particular chapter with a large coffee stain plopped into it. Uh, and the Fat Studies Reader, one of the early and foundational books in Fat Studies. And they're both from our collection, and we'll look inside. Fat Studies, so four chapters have extensive marginalia and pink highlighter. Many comments are nasty and frankly abusive. These ones aren't, but they're probably about, it's about as full as it gets. Uh, I was going to put it on reserve for my class, but I didn't. Uh, Dark Side of the Nation. This one is a heavily used book, very heavily used book, um, which has been underlined and highlighted by many students. And what you can't quite see here, you get a bit of a sense of it, is that there are different generations of commentaries, student after student after student. And in some ways, this particular thing could be seen as an archaeological artifact through which you could reach generations of students' engagement with the ideas in this foundational book on the limitations of imagined community in the Canadian nation, which is really interesting, actually, given that it's community on the page as well. This kind of thing isn't unique to my library. I've seen heavily underlined works like this at other university libraries as well, and at public libraries. If you're like me, you probably had a really visceral response to seeing university library or any library books like that marked up like that. Uh, chances are, when you saw highlighting, coffee stains, underlining, marginalia, you might have been frustrated, enraged, grief-stricken, any kinds of emotions like that. You might have gasped and thought, oh my God, I can't believe students do this. And I know that I do as well, and I did as well when I saw this. And so my question then is, why? Why include these as examples of community? It seems to be counter to the whole thing. So my question then is, how can defaced library books, what can they tell us? And how can we use them to teach students? Because when I look at these from the perspective not as a library user, but as someone interested in archives, this stuff is golden, right? Look at all the stuff I can learn from that. I can learn about print culture. I can learn about the history of ideas. I can trace lineages and genealogies of learning communities. I can get a sense of popular opinions or less popular opinions. I can learn something about technologies of learning, kinds of pens, et cetera. In some cases, not the ones here, I can get a sense of the membership of the learning communities. What languages is the marginalia written in? What kinds of handwriting? So marginalia is a treasure, and people have been scribbling in books for centuries. So I could spend hours just unpacking the stories here. These books and the notations are layered with them. Anything's possible. So what these do also tell you, though, is that library books are about community, about people coming together to share a love and need and passion, but they're also, as the FAP Studies reader marginally demonstrates, about venting, about confronting things that provoke visceral and sometimes violent responses. And in their material form, they reveal this community, not just in the marginalia and underlining, but also in the date due steps, in the thumbed up sections, the way the spine is cracked, the way the book falls open or doesn't, the stains at various points, the book that's been loved in a bathtub, for example, the number of times it's been taped up. And each of these material traces reminds readers that others have traveled here before. Um, of course, we don't want researchers to deface library books in order to make communities of readers visible. But what can we take away from examples like these, and how can we use them to further conversations about learning communities? What happens if instead of cursing and tossing such books in the garbage, we choose instead to keep them? so we can develop an alternative library to thinking about how it is that we engage with ideas, with books, with each other. Could we construct a library or archives assignment about books like these so that students can engage both with the ideas presented in the text and those in the margins? Could we develop a collaborative art installation project that asks students to continue and or reimagine the conversation? Could we develop a project around respect, critical responsibility, care? All of these possibilities offer ways of making scholarly visible, community visible in spaces like books that often seem isolated, alone, and quiet. And ways into practices that other, are otherwise harmful, violent, they redirect the horror of a vandalized page into possibility or potential. And they offer possibilities for practices of wonder. Now, I just wanted to wrap up because we're getting close to time here. My time is a little bit off. Um, offer a couple of conclusions here. So serendipity, tactility, and community are, for me, essential ingredients for a practice of wonder. 
They're about engaging with materials with our whole bodies, with all of our senses, all of our emotions, and all of our intellectual faculties. They're about being with research in ways that transform the researcher in deeply embodied ways. As I write in my book, my archival research fundamentally unmoored me, like it totally undid me. As a purely intellectual endeavor, the project was rich, full of possibility. But as an embodied endeavor, it was an emotional minefield. Um, wonder, we might recall, is astonishment, awe, admiration. It's about magic, things that shouldn't be possible. But like awe, and indeed like beauty, and like the sublime, wonder is also about danger and possible evils. There's a too muchness in wonder. It holds within it the possibility of social disruption um, and the deep vulnerability of becoming undone. I want to leave the presentation with two quotes from two writers whose thoughts strongly influenced my own research at different times and in different places. And the first is from the work of an 18th century proto-feminist writer named Mary Wollstonecraft. And in 1796, she published uh, an epistolary travelogue called Letters Written During a Short Residence in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, an immensely personal work. And it's infused with thoughts and feelings of a woman of sensibility lamenting the demise of an, uh, a, a romantic relationship and experiencing her role as a new mother. And at a key point in the narrative, while gazing upon, she's traveling through uh, the fjords um, in the Nordic countries, while gazing upon pine saplings struggling to grow in stone crevices, Wollstonecraft reflects on the close relationship between life and death, the here and now and eternity. And she comes to a waterfall, and this is what she says, reaching the cascade, or rather the cataract, the roaring of which had a long time announced its vicinity, my soul was hurried by the falls into a new train of reflections. The impetuous dashing of the rebounding torrent from the dark cavities which mocked the exploring eye produced an equal activity in my mind. My thoughts darted from earth to heaven, and I asked myself why I was chained to life and its misery. Still, the tumultuous emotions this sublime object excited were pleasurable, and viewing it, my soul rose with renewed dignity above its cares." Grasping at immortality, it seemed as impossible to stop the current of my thoughts as of the always varying, still the same torrent before me. I stretched out my hand to eternity, bounding over the dark speck of life to come. For me, wonder here is that sublime balance between life and death, between the power of the natural world on the other hand and our position with it in the other, between a life tethered to the earth and a soul that rises above its cares. Wonder is a space of ultimate vulnerability and equally of ultimate grace. And to enter in this space as researchers is to enter into a space of radical openness and to operate from a position of profound humility, but also of really deep passion, care, and respect. So research as a practice of wonder is also an act of honoring. My second quote comes from Judith Butler's 2004 work, Undoing Gender, a book where I read during the very first term of my PhD. And in this a book, she writes, let's face it, we are undone by each other. And if we're not, we're missing something. If this seems so clearly the case with grief, it's only because it was already the case with desire. One doesn't always stay intact. It may be that one wants to or does, but it may also be that despite one's best efforts, one is undone in the face of the other by the touch, by the scent, by the feel, by the prospect of the other, by the memory of the feel. Research is never just an intellectual pursuit. It's about our desires, our griefs, our joys, and our sadness, and our questions and our searching, and about putting ourselves in the way of chance, acknowledging multiple ways of knowing and building connections with others. And in the humanities and social sciences, it's about becoming undone. We are, after all, as Virginia Woolf observed and reminded us, we are the thing itself. And with that, I want to say thank you. All right. Thank you, Sonia. This is Mark from ACRL in Choice. Um, it looks like we have a few minutes here for to take any questions that may come in um, from the audience. So I would say if you do have um, questions that you would like to to put to Sonia, now is a great time to drop those in the uh, Q and A box. All right, and we're, we're getting a few notes from, from attendees. Mary says, thank you, Sonia. Um, and Cheryl says, a beautiful and eloquent presentation. Thank you. 
uh, Miranda says, that was so good. Whoa. <laughs> so uh, definitely appreciating the presentation. Um, all right. And it looks like we've got a bunch of questions coming in now. Um, so I'll do my best to get through as, uh, as many of these as we can in the time that we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we do have one question here about whether the webinar is being recorded, and yes, it is. Um, so if you're looking for a recording, you should be receiving that sometime tomorrow morning. Um, everyone who registered should get it. <clears throat> All right, so going back up to the top here, we have a question here from Nicole who asks, um, are there ways to cultivate serendipity in the digital environment? What do you think, Sonia? Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I went, when I was preparing this, I went looking at our online catalog just to see what I could do. <laughs> and it actually, it does have a section in our, in our particular catalog, and I don't know what our catalog system is, um, but it does have a section that says books like this. And hmm. that leads you to other books uh, on the topic that perhaps you hadn't keyed in. So it does perhaps offer a way in that way. Um, that was the only thing that I could see in our catalog that allowed you to go, that allowed you to do things like just flip through a book, <laughs> in a sense, right? <laughs> or just walk the aisles, walk, yep. walk the stacks a bit. Um, but that's the only thing that I could think of, apart from, I don't know how else to do it with, an, with, a, with the e-catalogs that we have now. And those catalogs are super vital, but I wonder if, I, I just, I worry that we've lost something along the way. And so that's not a very helpful response. I just know that there is that one section in our catalog where you can actually find books like this, and it does sort of open up a sort of a bookshelf for you. Great, great. Uh, yeah, it, it, a tough a tough problem there, really, and in some yeah. ways. One that I think even the technology people are, are starting to look at online offerings and say, hey, there's something missing here, right? You can't just discover something. Um, I know I've, I've heard presentations from vendors where serendipity is absolutely something they're trying to find ways to create. So I, I think it's yeah. a big problem. Absolutely. Um, we've got a, a question from Mary here who says, do you have any suggestions for inspiring students to experience this openness and wonder? I honest, What I try to do is I try to give assignments that are not just the straight up essay assignment. And mm -hmm. that's because that, because that, I guess, I don't want to say pushes them out of their comfort zone, but moves them into a different space where they can't just rely on the routine that they developed beforehand, right? Be something becomes, um, and writing an essay becomes almost automatic at a certain point. I know I have to do this, X, Y, Z, done. Mm -hmm. So if I give a different kind of assignment, that forces a rethinking. And some of those assignments are assignments that ask them to think more with their bodies, right? So some of them are creative-based assignments. I've also had, when I've had a library assignment, ask them for part of the library when they've had their library introduction, I give them a call number and they have to go find the books next to, next to it <laughs> rather than that exact call number. And, okay, what's the book next to it? What might be interesting about the book mm. next to the one that you were looking at? Um, but really it's about getting people physically into a library and feeling books again because I think... You, I've had students who've come third year and have never gone into the library, which to me is, I, I can't even imagine it as someone who's had a library card my whole life, um, that you have not gone into the university library for three years. But for me, I guess it's about getting people into the library and also breaking up their expectation of what an assignment looks like, which then asks them to think differently about what knowledge is as well. Excellent. Excellent. Um... We've got a, a comment and a question here from Jocelyn who says, I'm very excited to read your book. Um, what was your most surprising discovery in the archive? Oh, what was my most surprising? I think the most surprising discovery, and it feels completely silly when you think about it now, the most surprising discovery was how emotionally overwhelming it was. And I think it was because I went into the archives as, I've done archival work before, like my students writing an essay. <laughs> <laughs> I've done archival work before, off we go. And yep. I hadn't realized how hard it would hit me. And I think that was the most surprising discovery 
that I made was actually about how do I work with this material when I can't distance myself from it. So it was actually a personal discovery. Um, relatedly, uh, it was a discovery of a few other ancestors that because one of them had just wandered, at some point left the plantation, nobody knows how, was in a slave register earlier on, but was not in these accounting declarations, which people had known about. So that might be related to that. And also finding the ship's log for the ship that brought uh, my uh, great, great grandmother over from India to Suriname, that I could get that ship, not, the, not that exact log, but that ship, most of its records were two minutes away from my office. I had no idea. So, But really the biggest learning was I had no idea that I could be that emotionally touched by archival materials, which seems self-evident. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got another question here from Patricia. Who, who says, lovely thoughts, and, agree, I, I, and I agree with them all. I run a materials library, which should be all about uh, touch and serendipity, but students and the faculty want efficiency. Do you have any ideas on how to slow that sort of research down? I totally appreciate the idea that the, everybody wants efficiency. Um, as faculty members, too, we're driven by how many things can you produce in X amount of time and can you do it more? Um, so I understand that too. I think the only way to do it is to really, and to ha is, is to really work with materials themselves. I, I don't know, I have no idea, apart from having bigger conversations around what is our larger purpose here. But I think a lot of us, and this is why the slow move, slow professor movement started as well was really a sense of this is not working how can we do things differently and that's structural change that's not only at the individual level but i think at the individual level it's okay instead of working with a computer what can we do without the computer how can that return us to touching things to feeling things and how can we move away from the, the technological side of things what can that do i feel like i'm reading courtney mom's novel again okay, sorry <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see, what else have we got? Um, hmm. So let's see, Jeremy says here and, and asks really, could you speak to the balance uh, to let me see if I can make sense of this. Could you speak to balance the appreciation of physical books with the use and or reach of eBooks? So I'm not sure I entirely follow that question, but is the, do you see some sort of a balance um, between the ability to appreciate the physicality of a book um, that can be struck, you know, with, within eBook? Is there some, you know, have, is there some way that an ebook can mimic that or, or achieve that? Um, have you ever experienced anything of that na of that nature? Where, you know, I know on like a, a Kindle, they're always trying to tell you you're this far in, you're this far in. Um, <laughs> what, what 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 do you have any thoughts on that ebooks and, um, and the physical experience of them? So I, I I will start by saying that I think they need to be complementary to one another, right? Mm -hmm. Like I do think that there's a necessity for both. Yep. And for any number of reasons, we do need, like, the the ability to for me to be able to go and search, do a deep search through electronically makes certain things much easier, right? So I started my PhD. I was still photocopying journal articles from hard copies. I don't have to do that now. I appreciate the fact that I can just, there's a PDF of it waiting for me, right? So I, I totally understand that and the amounts of things that I can find, but that needs to be balanced out with, this notion of being able to touch something, being able to find something by accident, and so on. Um, when I have seen ebooks work really well is actually in the period before things were fully standardized in books or more standardized in actual physical books either, right? So I spent a lot of time doing 18th century studies, and you can look at early English books online and uh, 18th century collections online, I think it is. Um, and both of those, when you see the e-books, they are very clearly not the same kinds of e-books as the ones that anything that's been produced in the 20th, 20th and 21st century, right? They look 
different. And because they look so different, they get a set, you get a very diff, distinct sense of how they feel, right? So they, they, they automatically feel different. There isn't, even though it's an ebook version, the fonts are different. The TypeScript is different. There's the, the S's that look like F's and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm wondering, is there a way to translate some of that even when things start to look a little bit more standard? So in the case of my telepathy book, if that was an e-book, would color help more? Would there be some way of showing that you're turning a page rather than just, oh, here's the next part of the PDF, right? So is it a way of showing pages somehow? Uh, is there a way of showing somehow being able to mimic thickness of paper, right? Just so that the, the, the actual physicality of a book is retained even though you're reading it in an e-version. Um, I do know students have sometimes brought Kindle books into class rather than the actual physical book. And what's frustrating, they find frustrating is that often there's no page numbers and they find that endlessly frustrating yeah. um, because it does, <laughs> because it shifts for the font size. And I appreciate that with my aging eyes that I want everything a giant font. but you know, you can't tell what page you're on anymore, right? So you've lost the context. So if an e-book can actually mimic an, a real book so that that way you get the best of both worlds, you get the ability to acquire something where you don't have to be in a big urban center to actually see the physical book, but you actually get a sense of the physical book. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, a lot there and a lot to, yeah, yeah, really an interesting topic. Um, I, I'd like to, I think we've got maybe time for one or two more questions, depending on um, how quickly we make our way through them. So uh, here's one from Naomi who asks, any thoughts on the sort of the tactile approach to research, uh, stealing the archival materials from future generations? Um, and so I, I guess with that, maybe the act of interacting with the archival materials, degrading them in some way is, is you know, do you have any thoughts on that and, you know, the, you know what that there is you know yeah, certainly with the 19th century materials that stuff needs to be really carefully protected because that paper is like it's pulp that's it right so i actually return some materials right back to the archivist cuz i can't even look at this because just me opening the file was going to cause problems so i totally appreciate the need to hold on to things that being said, I remember being told by an archivist years ago that materials from like the 13th to the 18th century were actually much stronger than anything available today because there was so much sort of fabric inside the, 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 the paper, right? There was so much linen, et cetera, in the paper. So um, that that material was actually very strong. Uh, there are ways, I mean, there are certain kinds of, uh, in the archival collections I've worked at, often the materials have far cushier places to sit than I do, right? So they have very special cushions. They have the very the, the velvet-colored snakes so that you're not ever pushing a binding too far. You're never holding something down. You have gloves to put on, all that kind of stuff. So I appreciate the need to protect things, uh, but is there a way to find a balance? Is there also a way, for example, as I suggested with the Fat Studies reader Dark Side and Dark Side of the Nation, can we have some archival materials that are sort of quote unquote play materials in some sort of way where there are, so that people can get the sense of here's what this touch, even if you can't touch everything, mm. here's what something might look like. It's sort of like, you know, when you go to a museum and sometimes they'll have one artifact that everybody can touch to get a sense of the thing that you can't touch, right? Mm. Or that you've got a copy of the original that feels like the original, looks like the original, is the same size as the original, but that protects the original. Is yep. there some way of doing that so that you've still got a sense of, of, of this notion of touch? That might be one way forward as well. Definitely. And, and I wanted to get to the second part of Naomi's question as well. Um, Naomi poses a, a second question. Also, do you have any thoughts on creating tactile situations for all abilities? Um, and she says, I can imagine the challenge is there. Do you have any thoughts on that? There are lots of challenges there. And I... I, I, it, what the question leads me to think of a years ago, I went to I was wor, uh, something about workshops for musicians, the back of my musician training, and there was a cellist there who worked with uh, children who were hard of hearing or deaf children. So these were children you not necessarily think of at all as being part of a music experience. And what she did to bring music alive for them is that she attached an extra sort of cello string 
to her cello itself, and she had them hold on to it so that they could feel the music. They might not be able to hear it, but they could feel it moving into their bodies. And so that was one way of working um, and making music available and visible and tactile in various ways to a community who's often otherwise erased from a music community. And so I'm wondering if some kind something that there are ways of working that allow that to be possible. Um, certainly, I uh, our center of student our center for students with disabilities works on various accommodations and working with the kinds of technologies that they work with and bringing that together with archival and library material could be really interesting to see what kinds of possibilities could emerge in relation to the kinds of accessibility technologies that now exist. Hmm. Yeah, that yeah, that's really interesting. That's yeah. Um, well, I, I hate to stop, but we, we are coming to the end of our time. Um, and I certainly don't want to keep anyone um, past their sort of promised time. So I will say uh, thank you, Sonia, for taking the time to present. Um, as I think the attendees have indicated, this is a really interesting presentation, very thoughtful, full of um, just tons of information. Um, so thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much. And um, I would just mention before we sign off um, that we did record the program today, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRO and Choice with a link to the uh, presentation. Um, and if you have a moment here before you take off, you should see a, a link to a quick six-question survey in your chat box there. If you could take a minute to fill that out to let us know what you thought of the presentation today, um, we would really appreciate that. So thank you everyone out there for listening in, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I hope the rest of your day is great. Thank you and bye-bye.